it's great to have everyone in the room from OJP, from our outside world. I know we have lots of people joining us online too. So thank you and welcome to what I know is going to be an extraordinary panel. I'm so looking forward to it. And in just a moment, we'll have the privilege of hearing from our three extraordinary Second Chance Fellows. Uh, and we're going to cap off our Second Chance Month by this moderated session by our alum, our first Second Chance Fellow, uh, Daryl Atkinson, who you will hear from in just a moment. Uh, before we do, though, I want to say a big thank you to everyone here at OJP for all of the contributions for making Second Chance Month so special. Uh, in particular, BJA, NIJ, OJJDP, uh, in partnership with the National Reentry Resource Center. No, we're not doing that yet. We're almost doing that. <laughs> this group, though, has pulled together a full calendar of events uh, to really lift up the spirit of Second Chance Month and the resources that we know are so critical to the field. And I also want to give a special shout out to my colleague, Rachel Brushett, who pulled together today's panel. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> It, it has been an exciting year in the reentry field. Last fall, OJP awarded more than $100 million to a wide range of reentry grants. We also expanded our investments in juvenile reentry and deepened our investments in reentry research. And in addition to the grants, we saw policy implementation in so many important areas, like the restoration of federal Pell Grants for incarcerated students for the first time in 30 years. This is a major development, and OJP had an important role in the early stages of that. We also saw, saw OMB implement Fair Chance Act hiring regulations that give formerly incarcerated people a better shot at, form, at uh, federal employment. And we also saw new innovations in Medicaid policy that bridge gaps in healthcare coverage for people leaving correctional facilities. And here at OJP, we have a wide array of solicitations for reentry. Many of them are open now, and many of them will be opening soon. So it's, it's a very exciting time for reentry. And in fact, this year marks 15 years. Not since Second Chance has passed, that's a couple more, but since we launched the Second Chance program here at OJP. And it is incredible to think how far we've come. In over a decade and a half, we've awarded more than 1,100 grants to support youth and adult reentry programs, not to mention substantial investments in research. Grants provided education, substance use treatment, job training, uh, job placement, and other services to some 400,000 individuals. And a new BJA-funded report from the Council of State Governments Justice Center, which was released last year, found that reincarceration rates have dropped some 23% in states around the country over this time period. That is very, very encouraging. We also continue to explore new ways to innovate to help meet the field's needs and to test new strategies. For example, last year, BJ launched for the first time the Second Chance Community-Based Reentry Incubator Initiative, which provides micro-grant funding through intermediaries to community-based smaller CBOs that are close to the ground and have unique expertise to reach people who need the services the most. Uh, this new program underscores our commitment to fulfilling our mission to strengthening the community's role as co-producer of justice and safety. And we're excited that I believe that uh, solicitation is open now, and we hope to expand that grant this year. Now, one of the biggest highlights and what we're here to talk about today is the work being led by exceptional people with lived experience. They are recognized reentry experts who are working here at OJP to bring an invaluable perspective in addition to their incredible, incredible talent, knowledge, expertise, and professional experience. I'm talking, of course, about our Second Chance Fellows. We're going to hear from all three of our current fellows, John Bay, Angel Sanchez, and Stanley Frankhart, in just a moment. And again, I'm so excited that leading our conversation today is a very dear friend of mine and of OJP, our very first Second Chance fellow, Daryl Atkinson. 
And here's where we do cue the photos. I cheated because Juan knew as soon as he heard Daryl Atkinson, it was time to go. But I threw in a, a Daryl Atkinson early. But we pulled together some of these photos because I really think it brings to life uh, some of the role that uh, that Daryl played and the Second Chance fellow played so early in the life of this initiative. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about the origin story, too, of how we got here. So I first got to know Daryl about a decade ago when I was serving as the staff director of the Federal Interagency Reentry Council. He had just been recognized by the White House as a champion of change, and he was being honored for his incredible efforts as an attorney at the Southern Coalition for Social Justice and as a founding member of the North Carolina Second Chance Alliance particularly for his work drawing attention to collateral consequences. Now, the Domestic Policy Council connected us directly as we were gearing up for a federal reentry council meeting. And Daryl and I had a, an amazing conversation. It was one I will never forget. We didn't know each other. And we connected, and he told me very directly, as he does, about how formerly incarcerated people needed to be at the table to inform the work of the reentry council. And the conversation was so uh, fruitful and productive, we decided we needed to have a more formal conversation. So we collaborated at that time to co-design an agenda uh, for our first meeting. This was October of 2014, so almost 10 years ago now. And uh, Daryl and seven of his colleagues, they called themselves at the time the Big Eight. Remember that? Uh, they came in to talk to the Reentry Council, to the senior staff members from across the federal government about the challenges faced by people with criminal records and what we could do together to address the policy barriers and really expand opportunity for people coming back uh, from prison and jail into the community. So at that first meeting, and I think we have one of the pictures from it, I was there for the Reentry Council, uh, the Assistant Attorney General at the time, Carol Mason, was there. Roy Austin from the Domestic Policy Council. It's a little bit of memory lane for some people in the room. Uh, the BOP director at the time, Charles Samuels, was there, as well as senior staff representatives from across almost all of the domestic federal uh, agencies at the time. And Daryl co-led a presentation with his colleagues that really showcased very persuasive challenges and policy opportunities that we at the federal table could leverage. Uh, I remember you shared a persuasive paper, too, on Ban the Box and a case study from Durham at the time. Uh, and we had a very wide-ranging conversation that spurred a lot of important discussion. And I remember being awed by Daryl's insights on these issues and really awed by his passion as well. And my enthusiasm was shared by everybody in the room. And at the end of that, we decided that we needed to hear directly from formerly incarcerated people about the policies that would impact them on a regular basis. So we were gonna do this quarterly and we did it quarterly. Um, and then we went a step further and we talked about how we needed an expert in-house to be working with us on a daily basis to really guide the second chance programs and the policies that the whole reentry council was working on. And that's the very short version of the origin story of how the second chance fellowship uh, originated. And we very quickly, Ruby will remember, it was in very short order, issued a competitive solicitation and, and Daryl was selected as our first second chance fellow. And as is his nature, Daryl hit the ground running. Uh, during what I think was his first week, I think it might have been his second day, we were on a plane with the Attorney General, Loretta Lynch at the time, uh, to meet with incarcerated people and correctional leaders in Massachusetts to hear both about the challenges they were facing and also about the innovations that were underway there. And again, you can see some of the, the photos from those trips. You'll also see photos of, this is Daryl facilitating a public conversation at CAP with the secretaries of Labor, Education, HUD, and the Attorney General. Uh, we were in Philadelphia together celebrating Second Chance Week. Uh, there's a picture of Daryl at a cabinet level reentry council meeting at the time. And he also was so innovative and really pressed the boundaries about how we thought about these issues. 
one of these weeks was National Reentry Week, and it was also, as it is now, National Crime Victims' Rights Week. And so Daryl partnered with, it's in one of the pictures, uh, a fellow we had working at the Office for Victims of Crime said, how do we think about this together? How do we disrupt the cycles of harm? How do we do this together? Uh, so needless to say, Daryl was an incredible ambassador for OJP and for DOJ, and his impact continues to be felt here in the reentry field. Uh, and he's left such a strong legacy built as a second chance fellow and that lives on in the three extraordinary fellows that are have followed in the footsteps and are working with us now. Um, so, Daryl, your contributions had a big role in inspiring us to reinvigorate the program. It was one of the first things we did when I got back here in 2021. And we have benefited enormously from the talents of our current fellows. Uh, I have had the good fortune to work closely with Angel and John, be on the road with them and, and uh, lots of places and look forward to working with our newest uh, fellow, Stan, in the days ahead. But it is an extraordinary contribution and extraordinary legacy. So Daryl went on to co-found and co-direct an organization called Forward Justice that has quickly become a leading advocate for social, race, uh, racial, and economic justice in the South. And he continues to bring the same passion and brilliance and grit to that role as he did here at OJP. So I clearly can't say enough about what Daryl means to OJP, uh, to me, and to the reentry field at large. And I'm just honored that you could join us today for this important panel. And without further ado, please help me welcome Daryl Appington. <laughs> Amy, uh, thank you for that generous introduction. You kind of told how I plotted to create me a job at LJP. And fortunate enough for me, I didn't crap the bed, so they didn't end the program and continued it afterwards, right? Um, your mentorship and friendship over the years has been invaluable to me and my family, and just thank you so much for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. When I reflect on my time as a second chance fellow in the administration of the first African American president, working for the first African American attorney general, the first African American woman attorney general, right? It makes me reflect and think on other transformational periods that we faced in this country. Because the election of the first African-American president certainly was a transformational period in this country. Another transformational period was radical reconstruction. And I'm going to bring you back, if you didn't know, to a DOJ origin story. During 1865 to 1877, this country went through a huge transformational shift. It's first. We enacted the 13th Amendment, which abolished chattel slavery. We enacted the 14th Amendment, which gave birthright citizenship and equal protection and due process. We enacted the 15th Amendment, which gave black men the right to vote. In 1870, we created the Department of Justice and passed the Civil Rights Act, also known as the Ku Klux Klan Act. DOJ was created to protect the rights of newly freed slaves, because there were people in the country that didn't agree with that particular change. And in order to ensure that folks were not re-enslaved, that folks actually had equal protection under the law, that folks had the ability to vote, DOJ was created as that enforcement arm. Fast forward 138 years later, where the election of the first black president, someone who would have been chattel 138 years previously, which speaks to the magical imagination of this country. We were facing a similar set of issues, but different, a similar kind of problem. In 2008, America, when the president was elected, Barack Obama, America, and still is, was the leading incarcerator on the planet. We had 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prisoners. 
And 95% of those folks were going to come home, right? So that resulted in about 700, 600 to 700,000 people coming home every year, predominantly black and brown, but white folks too, right? So you have this huge opportunity to shape the reentry trajectory of these particular people. And so the federal government and DOJ responded once again. They created the Federal Interagency Reentry Council. And this interagency body, and they appointed wisely Amy Solomon to run it. And this interagency body, one of the most effective interagency bodies in the history of this country, set out to say, okay, we have an opportunity to ensure these newly released 600, 700,000 people, predominantly black and brown, coming from communities of disadvantage, have the opportunity for a second chance, have an opportunity to reintegrate into the fabric of this country. And they took affirmative steps. Amy listed out some of them, right? Remove barriers to employment, made changes to experimental sites with the Department of Education in their experimental site program, which facilitated, and I helped pick some of those sites and pick some of those correctional institutions and college programs, which facilitated 12,000 people going to school. When I was incarcerated in 1996, two years after the passage of the 94 crime bill, which ended any Pell Grants, I would have given a digit of my finger to be able to go to school. So it was gratifying to be able to be a facilitator now with a new administration, with a new transformative period to help those 12,000 students get back to school and to establish an evidence base that eventually led to the restoration of Pell Grants. We made fronts on housing in establishing grant solicitations to facilitate expungements for young people who might be living in Section 8 housing with their families. I could go on and on and on. But I think probably the biggest transformational shift during that period was the cultural change. The first president to visit a, a correctional institution in the history of this country, almost 2,000 commutations, 2,000 people came home who otherwise would have been sitting in a cage, right? The creation of the Federal Reentry Agency the Reentry Council, the Fair Sentencing Act, which changed crack powder disparity from 100 to 1 to 18 to 1. Like, I could go on and on and on listing some of those accomplishments that were affirmatively taken on by this administration because they saw an opportunity to transform the country. You all, you have an opportunity every day. Don't take it for granted. Every day, you can do something to help bend the arc towards justice, right? This is the Department of Justice, right? And every day, you get that chance to bend that arc. We don't know when it'll be taken away. We thought, you know, that cultural shift, that momentum would last forever. It didn't. So when you are here, have the fierce urgency of now, because people's lives are dependent on it. I have the privilege to introduce my amazing panel, folks who gone on to, you know, take this role in even more exciting directions. First, I want to introduce you to John Bay. He's a 2022 fellow. John is the initiative director for the Open Doors at the Vera Institute of Justice. John's work while at OJP has focused on developing a comprehensive reentry blueprint, building reentry ecosystems, a blueprint in, for innovation. And it was published in April 2023. He's also been working in partnership with HUD to help develop their action plan on removing unnecessary barriers to housing for people with records. John, if you would join us on the stage. Next is... Next is Angel Sanchez. Angel is a 2022 fellow. Angel is currently working on his LLM at Yale Law School. His work at OJP has focused on education and maximizing the potential for Pell Grants. 
He has worked closely with partners at education on this effort and is just a leading thought leader uh, in the criminal justice field. Angel, will you join us, please? <laughs> And, and then lastly, our newest fellow, who I'm getting to know better, Stanley Frankhart. Stanley is a program coordinator at Licking County Coalition for Housing. His project at o OJP will take on taking lessons learned at the local level in terms of what innovations are working in the housing space, particularly for populations with mental health and substance use disorder. Uh, Frank, Stanley, if you could join us on the, on the stage, please. So I guess we can start off with first question for all of you all. What drew you to want to fulfill this role? So first I want to say, Daryl, thank you for really paving the way for us. Right. Um, just hearing your journey and the origin story, it's truly amazing. And big shoes to fill. They went and got three of us. Right? <laughs> um, as I was like reflecting on kind of my the, the impetus behind my my desire to uh, become a fellow, I think it really was like two things. One was curiosity, and second, a mission. Right. So the curiosity portion was I've always interfaced with uh, BJA and OJP as a, as a grantee, as a technical assistance provider. Oh, thank you. Um, as a peer reviewer. And I kind of, I was really curious about what it was like to potentially be working, right, in the system, seeing what's under the hood to see how it operates. The mission aspect you know, I recognize BJA as a, as a funding entity, first and foremost. Uh, BJA funds, you know, so many different programs, and those uh, programs, they impact policy change. They, you know, produce people with lived experience that are advocates. Um, so I see this real power in, in funding. And I think that, you know, funding, it, it shows our values. It shows our beliefs. Uh, I was reading this New York Times article where, you know, the, uh, the author he was looking at his credit card statement, and while he said that his uh, his values were around family, um, all of his charges were around work travel, mm -hmm. right? So there so there was this misalignment. The same thing with you know funding criminal justice efforts. Um, you know, we can fund programs, right? But how are we really uh, supporting, as A.G. Solomon mentioned, the, the, the co-producers of justice and safety? So what I wanted to do in my time here was produce something that can be memorialized, the, the ecosystem report that you mentioned, and plant a few seeds about how we can fund differently, fund so that our values and our beliefs are reflected. <clears throat> well, I, I, I definitely appreciate the question. Um, you know, what, 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 what compelled me to, to apply and to want to be here because there needed to be something very compelling to try to do that application in two weeks. Um, <laughs> it, it was many um, sleepless nights that I still remember. Um, and, and, and in retrospect, I'd say it's absolutely worth it and encourage anyone who's considering it to do it. But um, so I, I, I'll, I'll share first um, a, a less professional one, but a more personal reason that I applied. I think you and I met um, in person when we were in Pennsylvania, and it was the first time that we had a convening of formerly incarcerated leaders that were able to have a town hall to um, engage those presidential candidates and have them answer questions that were important to our community. And I remember uh, shouting you out, telling you how much it, 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 it inspired me, how, how, how much it was on my mind. And what I've come to personally learn after realizing that 
whatever work you're in, whatever work you're doing, it has oftentimes a good mission and purpose, but it's going to demand all of you and some. And so what that's going to leave you with is a survivor's guilt of all the other areas you're not working on, all the other people you're not helping. And for me, it's a lot of my friends that are locked up in prison, friends that I don't even have the capacity to write. Um, and so early on when I was entering university and it was taking a lot out of me just to legitimize my, my, my place there, um, I, I was torn. And then there's times I need leisure. I need my, my own um, fun time to reset and feeling guilty that I was experiencing that. And something came to me and since then this commitment has continued. And it's that, Angel, you just doing what you're doing, saying no to quitting, committing yourself to breaking barriers is itself a contribution. And if you continue doing that, don't feel guilty about everything else you're doing. Feel a part about what you are doing. And so this was one more place where I saw someone inspired me um, who broke a barrier by being the first. And I thought, let me continue sending that signal. Let me continue memorializing the reality that this could be possible. And so that's what gave me the, the umph to continue through those sleepless nights in, those, in that two-week period. So that's the personal reason I, I applied. And the, the, the professional practical reason or the policy reason was I was very concerned that when Pell got reinstated, much like every government service, when it fails, it isn't the implementation, it isn't the policy that gets blamed, it isn't the technocrats that administer it, it's the people who are supposed to benefit for it, for it, from it that get blamed for its failure. So I wanted to make sure that if I could get my hands on any microphone, no pun intended, but I wanted to sound the alarm and say, these are all the fault lines so that if it does fail, please let's not blame the inside students for its failure. Yeah, um, very much like Angel, I think too, mine is more personal, um, being impacted by the system myself. I've seen the barriers and the gaps in the housing sector, um, and now I get the privilege of overseeing a program that I once was a participant in. And so being able to see those gaps, those barriers, and advocate for changes in policies, advocate for changes in funding, advocate for changes in how we implement these housing programs is a huge part of what my work and my contribution is to those who invested in me. So that's one uh, personal reason why I think I should be, um, why I was um, navigated to this fellowship, but then also professionally, um, just having statewide uh, impact in our Returning Home Ohio program, our Community Transitions program, and covering 13 rural counties in the state of Ohio. I noticed that there were some disparities specifically for those rural counties around reentry housing and what reentry housing should look like for individuals in very remote, sometimes inaccessible areas. So for that reason, I thought of great ways to really truly bring solutions to individuals who are impacted by these very systems. I got it. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> um, no, that's, that's, that's great. Um, you know, each experience is an exchange. You know, whatever you touch, you change, and whatever you change, changes you. Mm. What would you tell OJP about their side of this exchange? What should they know for the next set of fellows to make sure that they create an environment of success? What have you learned from your experience that you would share with them so they can have the most productive environment to host fellows. And because of BJA's success, other departments in the, in the federal government are thinking about hosting fellows with lived experience. This is an important learning laboratory, if you will. So what lessons would you share with BJA and those other institutions when they're hosting people with lived experience. So I, I definitely want to go first on this one. I had scanned the room as you were asking that question, and I had the privilege of seeing ten things back there. Um, first, I would say to OJP, meet with her. Um, she was gracious enough to learn about and um, take note of all the challenges that come with the, the, the initiating of everything, anything that's new for the first time. There's a lot of tests. Um, stress tests that, that one has to go through, and you don't go through them until you actually go through them, um, or you don't discover them until you actually go through them. Um, but Tenzin has been um, phenomenal in, in taking note of those things, and I think I could say this from the 
the, 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 the classes of fellows that have come after that they decided to learn from those, uh, that feedback and implement it and it has become a much more streamlined experience. So thank you, Tenzing. So to the OJB folk, OJP folks, please um, engage with her. Um, the other thing I, I would like to say is um, uh, the, the leadership of, of, of Amy, Brent, you know, I, I didn't know the hierarchy and it was a good thing I didn't know the hierarchies, right? Um, and, and in large part that ignorance gave me enough confidence to do things that would probably seem radical and the end was for the better of the institution and i have been celebrated by people like ruby for them like our director carlton and and my advisors in in, in ojp and what i'm trying to point out here is that when, when i first when we first got here, I remember Amy went out of her way to, to, to set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting with us just to introduce herself. And the first thing she was excited to show me was the pictures that she had taken with you, Daryl, the pictures when they had restored Second Chance Pale, to show me how much she cared about this and how that was part of her desk. Um, and I left there just feeling like Amy was a colleague. And that ignorance was very helpful in my confidence to feel like I had a safety net. I had room to make mistakes. Um, sadly, you know, we have this demand of people who had the least to give, to give the most and, and expect the best and perfection, unfortunately. And then that can be very debilitating. So I attribute a lot of my success to both the BJA leadership, the, the, the advisors and, and OJP's leadership in and making me feel like, you know, the, the, take risks, obviously within parameters, but take risks. Um, and, and, and we're here to, to, to empower that. As far as it relates to other agencies, they're already taking notes. So it's not that they want to. I'm proud to have given and advised the Department of Ed at Octe and the development of the fellowship program. We are happy and proud to hear folks at the Bureau of Prisons interested. And I cannot imagine the symbolic impact the aspirational message that's going to send to see formerly incarcerated people in the Office of Leadership at the Bureau of Prisons. And so I'll stop there, but I definitely wanted to shout out Tenzing. So thank you, Tenzing. I see why you wanted to go first. Yeah, I have to <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I'll, I'll definitely echo Angel's gratitude, but and I think the one thing that I would add is um, the one thing I learned and experienced was camaraderie, right? Having brought two of us on at the same time. You forgot that one, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, camaraderie between us, right? Senior advisor, Eddie Bocanegra, right? All being here at the same time, just referring through ideas, right? Uh, just sharing our experience. I think that was like so helpful and powerful and just, helping me navigate and, you know, helping us navigate together. Um, so if there was a tip, you know, I, I would say bring a group of us together because mm -hmm. we're all unique. We all have different things to contribute and we can learn and build off each other. Yeah, very briefly, I'm still in the very new onsetting and onboarding process of OJP, BJA, all of that stuff. So I would just say very much like John said, the camaraderie, um, I think the relational component of what this fellowship offers can be something that um, OJP and BJA can lean into in the future, specifically around second chance, um, because all those contributions look very different. But all those contributions make instrumental strides in the work that we're doing day in and day out. And so I think that camaraderie, that fellowship component, right, of a fellowship, um, leaning into that could add so much value to the work being done. Awesome. Awesome. And in my introductory remarks, I talked about these transformational periods that we've had in our country and what we can learn from them. In the first reconstruction, W.E. DuBose said that newly freed slaves had three primary goals that they wanted to achieve after they were released. They wanted to reunite with family. They wanted land so they could have a place to stay and some economic vitality. And they wanted the ballot, right? In this new transformational period, panelists, what are the top issues that you're seeing that are in the reentry space that need to be addressed that OJP should be focusing on? 
Well, I'll start off kind of uh, building off of some of the great work that my predecessors have done with housing. I think one of the top primary issues um, that I'm seeing ground level and that I think we're seeing nationwide on the grassroots level is the pathway to home ownership, right? For individuals that are coming home, the number one barrier seems to be housing. So, and one of the top contributing factors to building wealth, wealth is home ownership. So creating permanent housing solutions through home ownership is something that I think OJP needs to be paying attention to, building policies, funding that kind of work, because that is what leads to the reunification of families. That's what leads to the stability of folks reintegrating back to society. That's what leads to individuals then being able to lean into those other peripheral issues that maybe they need to overcome and continue to address. So I think that's from my ground level purview what I see. I'm glad you mentioned uh, the work briefly because um, for those who, who have not, I'm sorry. <laughs> for those who probably haven't read, and I, I, I and I confess I didn't read this essay of his in the Atlantic on um, the, the Freeman's Bureau until not too long ago. But in it, there's a parallel there where you know he talks about you know the benevolent societies that, that which is philanthropy. Um, the Freedmen's Bureaus in different parts uh, of the South. That in some places it was great, in others it was a scam. In some places people were thriving, in others people were just barely making it. And if we're honest, that's oftentimes what the reentry landscape looks like. There's success in some places, there's struggles in others. Um, they might be questionable practice in one place, they might be excellence in others. And all that boils down to the reality that it, it's because we have a system that requires and depends on the need for those services. It is the system that depends on the need for these reentry um, services. And what am I saying by that is, it is because we have a legal system that brands someone as undesirable that then we need an entire system that makes them less desirable. It is because we have a system that brands someone as legally um, someone who you can exclude and discriminate against, that then we have to create an entire system that makes them persuasive to not be discriminated against, to be able to access the baseline thing, things that we know or that we get to experience when we are not impacted by the legal system. And so what would be a, a, a true solution oftentimes is to remove that barrier. And right now we're getting to see some of our own leaders in, in, in Georgia experimenting with some things like having a protected class. You know, it's very funny when I see papers or applications where organizations say, we don't discriminate on account of race, nationality, religion. Why like, you just telling me you stop at red lights, you follow the law. You're not doing anything more than you're supposed to, right? And so if we get to the place where you no longer can legally exclude this population, which means you no longer can legally brand this population as undesirable, and this population includes me, then what happened is that I don't, we don't need to depend on this economy of favors, this con economy of grace, this economy of patchwork, chant, and charity. If I get lucky and I'm from this geography and this jurisdiction and I run into this person, then I could be successful. And if I'm not, then I will probably not be successful. And sadly, the system is going to say that my failures was individually my lack of effort and will and commitment. So uh, what would be the ultimate ideal um, a, a solution is to get, drive ourselves out of a job by virtually removing the legalized structures that make us undesirable so that we don't need an entire other system that makes us less desirable. I think that was a good. A good. So, how, so how do we get there, right? I mean, I, I think one, and, and we didn't plan this, so. Um, <laughs> I, I think we take a look at how we view the work of reentry. When we talk about employment, housing, healthcare, family reunification, these things aren't criminal justice issues. These are just community issues. Now, you know, I know OJP, VJA, um, there may be limitations on how you all can operate, but you all also have the bully pulpit, right, of the federal government leaning into interagency partnerships, really rethinking to what Angel said, 
how we can remove those barriers. It's partly a policy fix, but it's largely like a narrative fix, all right? It, it, it's these emotions, it, 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 it's this fear that often created these barriers in the first place. So we need to elevate more champions of this issue, system impacted people, um, to tear down those barriers and really push the envelope on these issues. Um, and just just one thing, I mean, I, I, I think the past couple of years, we've really seen how this interagency inter coordination and working on these different issues have, have played out. So with the restoration of Pell Grants, right, led by Department of Education, um, you know, with OJP, VJA, um, you know, for years working on these issues, right? And then very recently, uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, they released their notice of proposed rulemaking that uh, you know seeks to remove barriers to HUD-assisted housing for formerly incarcerated people. Work that started in 2016, right, by mere guidance. So I, I think it's those types of efforts that we need to see more and more to really uh, you know improve reentry outcomes or improve public safety. Uh that's helpful. We're at our 10 minute mark and I'm going to ask one more question before we go to the audience because I want to build on John's point. Um, Valerie Jarrett who, in the Obama administration would start many a meeting around our criminal legal system reform issues with a simple quote, culture eats strategy for breakfast. You change the culture, you're going to be able to get all the policy and practice that you want, right? And to your point, John, narrative interventions, what are things that we can do culturally to change um, the environment to where policy and practice is so much more easy to adopt and implement? While we were, during my period, one of those efforts was to try to change some of the language that OJP and BJA and some of the other affiliate departments and Brent Cohen led that work. We worked on some of that stuff together. And that was one example of not using pejorative language that leaves people frozen in amber like ex-offender, ex-convict, ex-felon, right? And change your solicitations, change your websites, change your language to create a culture change. I'm going to ask our panelists, what are other cultural interventions that the department can take to create an environment where policy and practice just going to make sense because you aren't othering the person. You don't think of them of having five heads and six arms. They go to church just like you, drop their kids off at the, at the daycare just like you. They're just like us. And so policy and practice will make sense. What are other cultural narrative interventions that the agency can take to help create that kind of environment? Well, all right. <clears throat> so the 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 for, I don't even want to go any further than than the, the celebration that we're having today, which is these positions of leadership in federal government in institutions that, while they originated to help those who were marginalized and excluded, eventually became institutions that were used to marginalize and exclude. Right, and so. This is not something we should take for granted. So I want to start here. You know, there's this concept of demos prudence. So jurisprudence is the interpretation of law and how law is understood. There's demos prudence, which is the concept that law is interpreted and its interpretation is developed not just by the elites who understand the practice of law, but by the people who experience it and live it out. That's essentially the, the role of culture and the way that the people are brought into that um, symbiotic development of, of, of law. I've been entertaining this idea that this is an example of what I would probably call demos governance, mm -hmm. right? Which is how governance is not just by individuals who are um, of a particular pedigree and have a particular education, have a lot of the reasons to be in these positions because of their experience and their skill set, but also because the people are welcomed into this space and their expertise is brought into that. Who are those people in this case? And we're talking about the criminal legal system is those very same people who are impacted by them. And we're talking about violence in the community. We're talking about the community violence intervention organization.
organizations that are there who are day to day working, walking and working in those communities without a vest or a gun. Right. And we need to honor that. And there is this demos governance that is happening. And ultimately, you know, this is what what I hope we should be asking of ourselves, you know, not only, you know, laws influence culture, culture and people echo the law, but then that echo is re-echoed through subsequent policies. So it's this chicken egg thing. Oftentimes we try to put emphasis on one or the other, and really we're just putting emphasis on the fact that the thing we did hasn't been enough, and we're looking what else should we be doing. And so for sure, we should be working on culture, but never stop undermining policy. And then once we were doing policy, we should be returning back to culture. And I would say that the ultimate goal is to how do we get the, the, the philosophy, the ideas, the values culturally entrenched? Because initially, when we're asking people to change language, we do have to have the why to that what. Otherwise, it just feels very forced. Once culture gets entrenched, then you no longer are asking the why. We take it for granted. The why is because it came down from heaven like this, right? Which is why people who are criminally branded are excluded. Why? Because it's supposed to be that way. No longer is that question being asked. And so initially, when we're changing culture, we should be asked, answering the why so that we're not having people feel like they're being forced into something that they honestly have no buy-in. But most importantly, they'll get buy-in. I think of St. Francis of Assisi, preach at all times and sometimes use words. I've used a lot right now. Forgive me. Uh, but our, our role here, my role at Yale Law, going from jail to Yale, you know, it fetishizes the gives a click bait type of headline, but it does do some does something aspirational that at some point they'll have a number of people going to jail, <laughs> going to Yale from jail, um, <laughs> such that it becomes culturally entrenched. Yeah, I think um, to Angel's point, great greatly said, it's that idea of instilling the values, the why behind the what. And changing that cultural narrative and, and, and intervening in that cultural narrative, the reality of it is, is that there are next door neighbors. They're the people who bag groceries at our grocery store. They're the people who are possibly pastors behind a pulpit at the church you're worshiping at, right? They're the leaders of community based organizations. And so the reason why is because they are people who are making the most impact and influence in this landscape on a grassroots level. And being able to intervene and truly change that narrative of saying they're not just ex-offenders or just disimpacted people or no, they're changers, they're innovators, they're thought leaders, they're, they're Yale graduates, right? They're people that are making these um, true strides in society and in community that are prestigious in and of themselves, let alone adding the barriers and the nuances of trying to navigate a legal system that has significant barriers posed against them, right? So I think being able to really truly champion and herald those narratives, those testimonies, those stories, not just as the one-offs, not just as the exemptions to the rules, but the standard, right? To say like, this is why we need to do what we do because people are truly making systemic impact, systemic change, and that starts with personal transformation. I'll, uh, I'll offer something practical, and it, it goes back to something I, I, I talked about, which is you know, funding, right? And that's, that's a, a great lever, I think, to change culture is to become more proximate with funding. And I think it's happening right now with community violence interrupters. It's happening right now with community-based reentry incubator. Um, but, and it's not just what you fund, right? It's also who you fund. And how you build the support around them so that they can build, get more funding and build more advocates and build this ecosystem for, you know, just community safety, just, just, just renewed communities, right? Because that's what it's all about. I, I think we're at the end of our time. Rachel has already given me um, the sign. If we could all thank uh, these wonderful panelists uh, for their contributions today. <laughs>